Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jen Hicks. I am the Director of Communications and Outreach with Maine Woodland Owners. We are a nonprofit organization based in Augusta that works with woodland owners around from 10 acres to about 1,000 acres who are looking for advice, resources, and guidance around forest management. Um, we've been around since 1975. We have been um, available for thousands of woodland owners over the years, and we have a membership program. Uh, if you become a member, then you receive a monthly 20-page newsletter that provides a lot of resource and information that a lot of woodland owners have found useful. We also have a resource website at mainwoodlandowners.org, and we do programs like this one um, to help provide guidance and information for those looking to do more with their property. Um, and we're so glad to have um, some terrific resource people in today's program. And we're also very grateful that we are able to do this in two parts because it's a big topic around forest health and pests in, uh, in Maine. So um, we are doing this intro one hour program as a pre field tour program to give people some background information and updates so that the field tour on Saturday becomes um, a, a little bit more engaging. So um, my hope is that a lot of you are able to join us on Saturday, uh, but if not, that's okay. We'll get, you'll definitely get something out of tonight's program. Um, I want to introduce the landowners that we're, where we're having our field program, and that's Larry and Barbara Beauregard. They're in Old Town, and um, Larry, would you like to just speak quickly about your role with Maine Woodland Owners and a little bit about your property? Oh, ab absolutely. Uh, I've uh, been a member of uh, Maine Woodland Owners uh, for uh, quite a few years now, since before when it was called SWOM. Uh, and uh, we have uh, a woodlot located in West Old Town. Uh, we've been um, managing that for almost 40 years now. And uh, uh, what kind of brought this up was last season, we were walking around the woods and noticed that a number of our red spruce had some funny looking dry uh, tips on the branches. So we took a few pictures and worked on it and sent them to the Maine Forest Service to see what they thought. and. Uh, Gabe LeMay, one of our speakers tonight, came out to visit and we got an answer. Uh, so, you know, it uh, was really helpful. And in discussing this with uh, Gabe, the idea came up of presenting a program that we might be able to share. Uh, so this is the opportunity to do that, both uh, here online and with our field tour on Saturday. And we hope folks can come out and uh, share some of the experiences that we've had there. Yeah, and and you'll see other things on their property too. Um, that's the that's why we like to keep going back there. They they've done a lot of interesting um, approaches to invasive plants regeneration, um, trails, um, wildlife, wildlife. Mm -hmm. It's great. It's a great location. So um, hopefully, again, a lot of you can be there. Mm -hmm. um, I should also say that Larry is our chapter leader for the Penobscot Valley chapter that we have. We have 10 chapters as an organization so that we can localize our programming. And Larry has been a great point person um, helping us come up with ideas for an informative programs in the Penobscot County area. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes he'll even partner with neighboring county cha uh, chapters from neighboring counties. And that's always a nice opportunity as well. So um, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our main speakers for tonight. And these are the folks who will be at the field tour giving um, part of giving their in-person part of the tour. Um, Brittany, uh, can, I'll, I should have asked you how to pronounce your last name. Brittany. Oh, okay. It's a doozy. It's, it's pronounced Shapak. Shapak. Okay, helpful. terrific. And then Gabe LeMay. Um, both entomologists with the Maine Forest Service in the Forest Health um, Division. And they are um, you know, bringing a lot of uh, knowledge around forest 
uh, health issues, specifically around pests. Work with they also work with the pathologists, so it's they understand a little bit of the disease piece, but they're really focused in on on the pests, which is front and center now that we are dealing with um, emerald ash borer closer to home here in the Penobscot County area. So we're really grateful um, to have their time and they're gonna take, they're gonna do tag team. So I think Brittany, you're gonna do the first part of the presentation. And just a quick question for both of you. Do you want people to jump in with questions or would you like to have them wait till the end of the presentation? Either is fine. Do you have a preference? Doesn't matter I to you. I don't have a preference personally. Uh, okay. I'm I'm sharing my screen, so if there's uh, things in the chat, I just personally am not going to be able to see them. So, okay. Um, so let's let's wait. Go ahead and um, so there's a couple ways you can ask questions. Um, you can certainly turn off your uh, mic. I mean, turn your mic on and just jump in with a quick question. I'm sure that's okay. Or you can type your question into the chat, and then when the end of the presentation, at the end of the presentation, the speaker can see the the question. They can ask then. So uh, I think that those would be the two best ways to go from there, go to do that at this point. And um, certainly at the end, there'll be some QA. And I will also say that I will have to jump off in about uh, 15 minutes for, for my next meeting. <laughs> but you're in good hands with these folks. And I'm just again, appreciate everybody's interest and glad to see everyone here. So, Brittany, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jen. Um, so I'm going to turn the floor over to Gabe and I'm gonna take over the, the second half of the, today's presentation. Ah, sorry about that. I got no, it backwards. Yeah. So, All right. yeah. Just to be clear, we are in the same room, but I'm gonna be asking Brittany to move along the slides um, and then we'll just, you know, we'll go right through it. So Brett, I think we're ready for the next slide. So a little bit about us. We are both entomologists with the Maine Forest Service, as Jen said. Uh, we are in the Division of Forest Health and Monitoring, and so the mission of this uh, division is to protect the forest shade and ornamental tree resources of the state from significant insect and disease damage. We aim to provide pest management and damage prevention for homeowners, municipalities, and forest landowners and managers. And just a little bit about me, I joined Maine Forest Service last fall. Uh, before that, I was doing research on bark beetles in Florida. And before that, I was doing research across the state at a couple of other labs, including uh, the University of Vermont. But I'll let Britt say a little bit about herself now. Yeah, thanks, Gabe. Um, I'm also fairly new to the Maine Forest Service. I joined a month after you did. So uh, I've been here for about seven months now at this point. Uh, before that, I graduated from the University of Maine with my master's degree in entomology. Uh, before that, I was based out of Connecticut. I went to Western Connecticut State University. Um, got my bachelor's degree there and spent um, roughly just about four years working in tick research uh, as a project manager. So ticks are really my forte. Anything public health, uh, public um, or medical entomology is sort of um, what I enjoy to do. But we'll talk more as we go. And so for today's um, presentation, we've got a couple of things outlined. So we have five forest pests, emerald ash borer, as Jen had introduced, uh, white pine weevil, brown tail moth, hemlock woolly adelgid, and I will touch on ticks, of course. Um, and then we are going to touch on two diseases, those being beech leaf disease, European larch canker. Um, that being said, we are going to be going over more things in, during the field tour. So um, it would be a great opportunity for you folks to join along if you can, um, so that you'll get to see firsthand some of the ailments that could happen in your woodlot. All right, I will take over um, and talk about emerald ash borer right now. So at Maine Forest Service, we like acronyms, so most of these pests will be, you know, three, three letters. Uh, this is EAB, and so I think we're ready for the next slide. So emerald ash borer is a jewel beetle native to Eastern Asia. Uh, its hosts include many different species of ash in the Fraxinus genus. genus. Uh, we have a few different species here in Maine, and it is invasive in North America. So this is largely due to the lack of natural enemies and the lack of natural like, resistance in our ash populations. So here, EAB can quickly reach really high population numbers. Um, and when it does that, it can kill ash trees fairly consistently. So within five years of the initial infection. 
and the mortality rate for EAB is very high. So if a tree is infested with EAB, odds are it will not survive. And so it does this by tunneling under the bark and disrupting the natural water and nutrient flow of the tree. So the life cycle of EAB begins, I'll just begin arbitrarily in May. So May through September, eggs are laid in bark crevices by the adults. Um, these eggs will then hatch and then burrow into the bark to feed on the phloem just beneath. And so they'll do that for a number of months. Uh, throughout October and March, the larvae will proceed through different end stars, basically just different stages of growth. And then once they are done uh, feeding, they will overwinter. And so as you can see, let me see if I can. Can everybody see my screen? There you go. So the gallery to the left is a, you know, increasing in size as the larvae proceeds through the plum. And then the image on the right is the classic J shape. So this is the form that the larvae takes as it overwinters. In April, the larvae will then pupate and turn into an adult. And then in May, the adults will emerge from the trees to feed on the leaves actually for one to two weeks before they'll, you know, lay more eggs on the bark and the cycle will repeat itself. So here are some signs and symptoms that everybody should know. Uh, the most obvious one that we typically use is most obvious in the winter and that is blonding. So the center image right here, this is a tree where the outer layer of bark has been picked away by a woodpecker, which is attempting to eat the larvae that are just underneath the bark. So these woodpeckers are really good at discerning which trees have um, EAB larvae in them much better than we are. And so we kind of rely on them to, you know, mark these trees. Um, the south side of trees is more often blonded than others. So it's just something to be aware of. And obviously when there is a fresh blanket of snow, the wood chips are much easier to see. Also, people should know about D-shaped exit holes. If you have an ash tree that has uh, these shaped holes, that is very characteristic of this family of beetle, the Bupresidae. Um, in addition to D-shaped exit holes, S-shaped tunnels are also another character that you can notice. These, if you were to peel back the bark of a blonded tree, odds are you would maybe find these kind of galleries. Uh, S-shaped, this kind of like serpentine back and forth is very characteristic of EAB. Other beetles also create galleries, but they're not always uh, this consistent in the back and forth motion. Other symptoms that you might see are crown dieback on the bottom left. This tree has been infected and it has lost all the tree, all the leaves at the main crown, and it has attempted to, you know, create these epicormic shoots, which kind of shoot from the base as a kind of recovery, but odds are this tree will likely not survive. One last symptom that I'm just gonna throw out there is bark splitting. Sometimes in very severe infestations, the bark may split from those galleries underneath, and you'll see this kind of like strip right in the center. So, to track the spread of EAB, it first started, um, it was first confirmed in Detroit in 2002, and since then it has just consistently radiated outward. Uh, there was even a recent detection on the West Coast in Oregon, and there is a lot of, you know, mobilization by, you know, the federal government and the Oregon state government to kind of contain it as, as well they can. But to date, millions of ash have died from EAB, and multiple states have enacted quarantines to limit the spread of infected wood through, you know, firewood bans, anything like that. And so here in Maine, uh, EAB was first detected in 2018. This was uh, up at the North border. And then quickly, you know, soon after that, it was also detected at the South as well. In 2022, infestations were found in Waterville and Oakland, kind of in central Maine, that was quite the jump. And in response to this, there was an emergency order uh, that limited the spread of firewood within the state. However, uh, if you'll go one more slide. In 2023, there was a new confirmation in Newport. Uh, this just happened. And in response to that, as well as to another uh, couple of, it, uh, excuse me, a couple of other detections, uh, the emergency order was expanded to include all of this pale yellow region. So within this, within this region, uh, no uh, rooted trees, logs, or untreated firewood and timber can be moved uh, if it's ash. And the potential losses of emerald ash borer are huge. You know, in addition to just a loss of uh, food resources and for wildlife, the impacts on the hydrology and soil integrity of riparian wetland areas is huge. Almost half a billion ash trees in the state over uh, 
an inch diameter account for almost 2% of all the trees. And this is about $320 million potential economic impact. And it's also important to note that brown ash is a key material for traditional basket making, which is a central part of the cultural traditions of the Wabanaki people of the region. So what is Maine Forest Service doing? Uh, we have a couple of other, couple of different monitoring techniques that we use to track EAB as it spreads throughout the state. So our most extensive is the, is the Purple Prism Trap Network. Uh, we have almost about, I'm gonna say like 200 to 400 traps out at the moment. Um, these are sticky traps that are baited with an attractive pheromone that the uh, emerald ash borer is attracted to. Uh, in addition, we also have green funnel traps, which act in a similar way. Uh, these are more effective for monitoring populations that you know we know exist, whereas the purple traps are meant to be you know kind of catching any rogue ones that we don't know about yet. However, the most effective way to attract emerald ash borer is with ash. So what we do is we create these things called trap trees where we girdle a tree, but it's a shallow girdle. So it doesn't immediately kill the tree, it just extremely stresses it out. And so when the tree is stressed, it will emit lots and lots of these volatile chemicals that emerald ash borers attract to. So this tree that Colleen is girdling right here uh, will be a magnet for any emerald ash borer in the area. And so we, we do this at the very beginning of the season, and at the end of the season, we will cut down this tree, strip all the bark, and search for emerald ash borer that are inside. In addition to this, we also have a biosurveillance program. Uh, Cerceris fumapennis is a wasp, which actually naturally hunts uh, jewel beetles. And occasionally it will go after emerald ash borer. So we monitor their nests, as you can see on the very right bottom, and you know, intercept any prey that it brings back to the nest to see how many emerald ash borer it is actually collecting. So how can we protect our ash? Um, there is a lot of effort these days about uh, seed collection, especially at Humane. Um, basically, the idea here is that we need to maintain as much genetic diversity as possible. So once emerald ash borer has kind of, you know, spread throughout the state, this outbreak will eventually die down, but we need a way to restore the natural ash population um, as well as we can. So getting lots of diverse seeds so that we don't have that kind of genetic bottleneck is really important. Um, in addition, we have been active with biological control. So there are three species of parasitoid wasp, which hunt uh, emerald ash borer, and they are fairly um, host specific. So they're not gonna go after a lot of other species, but these are intentionally released in hopes that they will kind of, you know, boil down the, the emerald ash borer population. In addition to that, there are management options for emerald ash borer. Selective harvesting is one, as well as systemic pesticides. So there are treatments that you can do to save really high value ash, but it's not really practical or cost effective to do it on a large landscape. And so what you can do is help report sighting. So this is very important uh, and it helps us out a lot. So if you see any of those um, very characteristic signs and symptoms or even emerald ash borer itself, there are a couple of doppelgangers, please let us know. Uh, you can go to main.gov forward slash EAB and report a subject. And if you do, please you know, take lots of photos and collect emerald ash borer if you can, uh, that would really help us out a lot. So pivoting, uh, I'm going to go over a disease now. So this is beech leaf disease, which is fairly new to the state of Maine. We here call it BLD. So in 2012, uh, it was first reported in Ohio. Since then, it has spread eastward. And then in 2021, it was first confirmed in Maine. And this was in Waldo County and the town of Lincolnville. So BLD is a disease which can kill American and European species of beech, and it also expect, uh, impacts Asian species. And so, oh, here's just a more updated map. So as you can see in the blue towns, those were confirmed in 2021. And even in just a year later, it has continued to expand. And we are working on the 2023 survey uh, currently. So what are the symptoms? The most obvious one is the banding of leaves. This is a fairly uh, characteristic uh, symptom that is easy to recognize, especially if you're underneath the leaves. Um, you'll see these kind of darker regions in between the lateral veins of the leaf, kind of giving it this stripy appearance. And this is evident in both the, you know, warmer months and the colder months. So when the leaves dry up and they stick to the beach, uh, you can still see these darker regions. Mm -hmm. 
when beech leaf disease uh, progresses, you know, it gets worse. So there are further symptoms as, you know, these, uh, these trees exhibit like extreme BLD. So what you'll see is a distorted leaf growth. They might look a little bit leathery or a little bit raised and bumpy. Um, some of these leaves are, you know, they're barely recognizable as beech. However, there are some lookalikes to this banding that I was just describing. Uh, Araneum galls are made by an aerophid white uh, mite, excuse me. And this is kind of uh, raised, it's a little bit bumpy and it's lighter and it might have a slight discoloration as well. So as you can see in the, the bottom image. Also banding might occur uh, due to the woolly beech leaf aphid. And so if you do see banding, just be sure to check on the bottom side to see if you see any you know, white speckly dust. And that is actually an aphid damage. So that's not beech leaf disease either. And the disease progresses very quickly. So it typically starts in understory beech and it's most severe among beech regeneration and sprouts in the understory. So mature trees are killed more slowly over several years, but it does you know, consistently get worse and worse and worse. As you can see in the images on the right, uh, the top image was from 2021. This is somebody's backyard. And then pretty much exactly one year later, this is what it looks like. There's pretty much no healthy foliage on any of these trees. Um, one important thing to note is that we don't know how beech leaf disease and beech bark disease will interact. Beech bark disease has been in Maine for quite some time now. Uh, it's kind of causes that, you know, those um, warts or almost like acne on the, on the trunks of trees. Some people think that's just what beech looks like, but you know, it is disease. It just is not very serious. However, we don't know how it's going to interact with beech leaf disease and it could be worse. So that is something to be aware of. And so what is the beech leaf disease causal agent? So researchers have found a microscopic roundworm or otherwise known as a nematode, which is consistently associated with the disease. So this nematode is native to Japan, but it's likely not as simple as, you know, nematode causes disease. So there could be associates with uh, bacteria and maybe fungi. There's a lot that we don't know about it so far. And one of the most curious is how it actually spread. So how does this nematode get from tree to tree and how does it spread through all these towns that we saw in basically just a year. So there's a lot of research being done on this um, as well as the origin of the introduction. So how did it jump from, you know, that Ohio area all the way to Maine within, you know, just a few years. And so what is the Maine Forest Service doing? Well, we are monitoring it. Uh, we have nine long-term monitoring sites where we track the progression of disease, how severe it is and also how it's spreading throughout the landscape. So we have that map that we update fairly frequently. And there are treatments that you can do. There is a phosphite treatment being researched right now by some private forestry companies. This is a high potassium fertilizer, which is applied to the soil. The findings are still preliminary, but you know they are encouraging. So it's just something uh, to keep an eye on. It's coming around the corner, but it's still not completed yet. And what you can do is, again, help us report it. So currently we know it to be within this polygon. I don't know how up to date exactly this is. This is 2022. Um, but if you live outside of this polygon and you do see beech leaf disease, you can report it online um, by going to the Maine Forest website and reporting a pest or a sick tree and we'll, you know, we'll get on it. It'll be added to our database and we'll respond to you. Okay, the last species that I'm gonna talk to you about today before handing it off to Brittany is the white pine weevil. So Pisodes strobi is a native pest of white pine, jack pine, and Norway spruce. It also occasionally attacks Colorado blue spruce, scotch pine, mugo pine, and other native spruces. And it's a pest because the larval actually, the larval form actually kills the tops, the very, you know, leading shoot of white pine. And so when that leading shoot dies, it can cause uh, multi-topped or crooked trees affecting the timber's value. And so again, this is more of what I just said, but once that leading shoot dies, a lateral branch will attempt to become dominant. And so if there are two competing laterals, it'll result in a fork, but if there's one, it can still recover, but the wood that is harvested will still you know, kind of have that curve in it because it's not as natural as it could be. And this curve affects the, um, you know, the structure of the wood and it can cause compression and encase knots and things that kind of lower the overall quality of the harvest. 
So white pine weevil life cycle. It begins in early springs when in early spring when the adults emerge from the soil. They will um, overwinter in that soil just beneath the tree, and then once they come out, they'll go straight to the top. So they'll climb to the top and feed just below the very terminal bud. And then in May through June, females will lay eggs in the bark of that lead shoot. Uh, once the larvae hatch, they will tunnel into that woody tissue and then begin tunneling downward. So, and as they do this, multiple larvae will effectively girdle that shoot as they travel downward. And so any, you know, whirls of branches that are above that will, you know, be affected. And so they can affect as much to um, a foot and a half to two of the leader, depending on, you know, circumstances. And then after they are done with that, they will then pupate and emerge as adults as early as mid-July. And so what are some signs and symptoms that you can be aware of? Um, one is to look for drops of dry resin from the previous year's adult feeding, because the adults also feed on that leading shoot. Um, and you'll see these little white specks right on the leading shoot in the left-hand image. And then second, the obvious um, symptom is the wilting of that leading shoot. So this is kind of an early stage um, infestation. So the leading shoot hasn't dried up and turned brown yet, but it is drooping. So that's something to be aware of because you can intervene and help manage this. So corrective pruning is one of the uh, simplest methods where effect effectively you just cut below that, you know, girdling larvae uh, concentration and be sure to cut below it so that you don't leave any there, um, but then you can discard that and burn it. And you can also cut laterals to kind of encourage a recovery of that leading shoot. So you'll, you'll have to have a lateral replaced leading shoot, but you can do it in a way where the wood is, you know, salvageable. Um, and you can postpone this lateral pruning step until the following year, because if you cut it in the very beginning of the year before winter, and you put all of your eggs in that one lateral and you cut the rest, if that one gets damaged by snow damage, you're kind of, you know, you're sunk. So you can wait to pick a lateral until the spring. Also, uh, growing white pine under an overstory can encourage vertical growth. And so when the trees, you know, shoot up, they'll put less uh, energy into that secondary growth, into the width of the leader, and having a narrow leader actually affects the weevil success. So it likes a thick one where, you know, it, there's lots of material to eat, and so less of them are successful at, you know, making a new generation if that leader is thin. And it's also, you know, just farther for the adult weevil to travel all the way up to a, a tall tree than a shorter tree. There are chemical treatments as well. Um, there are multiple active ingredients registered in Maine. Be sure to check npirs.org uh, to see what is registered and what you can buy. This uh, treatment is best applied in May, just as the new shoots emerge. And I will make a shout out to Bob Seymour, who has an excellent uh, article in Maine Woodlands called Managing Damage from the White Pine Weevil, where he goes into great more detail. Um, and I would encourage people to access this if they can. All right, thanks, Game. Um, so I'm going to take over now, uh, switching gears a little bit to brown tail moth, a uh, favorite critter of everyone, I'm sure. Uh, so brown tail moth is invasive. It's originally from Europe, um, and it was introduced in the United States on live plants in 1897. Um, you can actually see in this image here that I have on the right, that initial introduction came right into Massachusetts, and it only took them a few years to become detected in Maine. Uh, and that happened in 1904. So some of the hosts for brown tail moth include oak, birch, cherry, elm, poplar, or aspen, uh, fruit trees, and other hardwoods. Um, so they will really just go about anything that they can. And I think there might be an echo, Gabe. I don't know if you mind muting. No, that's fine. I'm, oh, yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. All right, um, other things about brown tail moth here. So for their life cycle, they actually overwinter in winter webs. Um, they wind these very tightly bound uh, bunch of leaves together using their white silk. And any one of these winter webs has somewhere from 25 to 400 caterpillars inside. Um, so this is a winter web here. And this is um, somebody who had opened a winter web. So you can see all the very tiny uh, larval stages of the caterpillar here. And again, they're overwintering in these bundles of leaves that we call winter webs. And they can be found at the very, very tips of trees, not to be mistaken for Eastern tent. Um, those, those tent maker caterpillars are usually in the crook of the tree. They are closer down toward the bark. So 
when you're looking for these, uh, really look at the tops of the trees. So when brown tail moth came into the United States, um, there was not a lot of clues to what to do to try to mitigate and reduce damage, um, because not only does it eat a bunch of our, our trees, it also has toxic hairs on it that cause irritating rash. Um, so in the 1900s, some of the things that they came up with to try to mitigate that was to just cut trees down um, entirely. Uh, there was a federal quarantine that was enacted during this time, or we just hired a bunch of children to go and clip these winter webs out of the trees. Um, and for every 100 webs, you get five cents, which is insane to me. Um, so some of these pictures, you can see a ton of people very um, unsafe in the tops of the trees, removing the winter webs. This is a giant pile of winter webs. Um, so it was a big problem then. It's still a big problem now. And brown tail moth is what we considered a trifecta pest. So it has human health concerns, forest health concerns, and um, economic concerns as well. So a little bit on the human health part. Again, like I had mentioned, these caterpillars have really toxic hairs. The hairs themselves are actually hollow um, and there's a toxin that lives inside of them. And so when you get this rash, it's both mechanical and chemical injury. So you're going to be irritated from the actual stabbing from the hairs and also the injection of the toxin um, into your skin. And not to mention, uh, if that wasn't bad enough, the hairs very easily break off. So you don't even actually have to come into contact with the caterpillars. If you happen to be underneath a tree with a bunch of caterpillars and there it's happened to be a windy day and you're underneath it for long enough, um, you can also get the rash that way. Um, and unfortunately, that toxin that is in the hair is stable in the environment for one to three years. So it's um, it's something you have to keep in mind when you're doing yard work, gardening, or in your if you're in your woodlot um, and you've got a brown tail moth infestation. So speaking of woodlots, this of course has forest health implications. Um, so caterpillars have chewing mouth parts. They're going to be chomping on a bunch of different trees. And so you might have woodlots that look like this, where you'll have a bunch of your host trees that are missing leaves. And as you can imagine, this is pretty stressful for trees. Um, I do want to say though, as, as long as your trees are fairly healthy, if you have infestation from native caterpillars or brown tail moth caterpillars, um, your trees can withstand that uh, for a number of years before they um, potentially become too stressed for other things like drought or uh, wood worry beetles or things like that that might overcome uh, and, and kill it. But brown tail moth itself is not normally going to be the final nail in the coffin here. Um, that being said, it is a really stressful event. Our trees need leaves. Um, that's, our, that's how they get our, their energy and their resources to sustain themselves. Um, so although these trees, if they're healthy, they'll flush out new leaves before the end of the summer, we want to try to prevent uh, as much damage as we possibly can. So economic concerns here, of course, if your trees are not having a lot of leaves, it, they can't make a lot of energy and repeated years of this really high defoliation rates um, unsurprisingly leads to tree death. And in 2021, we had um, done a couple of aerial surveys in combination with our winter web surveys and documented almost 200,000 acres of defoliation from brown tail moth specifically. That's a lot. Um, so we are in outbreak status for brown tail moth um, started in just about 2015. It's ongoing. Uh, we're still working through the 2022 data, so I hope to have that added relatively soon. But um, it is it is less, which is which is good. I think it was right around um, the 150,000 mark, but it's still higher than we would want it to be. And so, uh, like I mentioned, the main Forest Service, what do we do? We do a lot of aerial surveys. Um, so we actually go up in a fixed wing airplane and we take a look at spots that look like this. Um, and we know that this is brown tail moth just based on the location and the timing of these aerial surveys. But if you don't have access to a helicopter or an airplane, like most people don't, um, this is might be closer to what your woodlot is looking like. So any of these host shrubs or host trees uh, might be completely defoliated. And I should add that these photos were taken uh, just earlier this month, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, so this is not winter. <laughs> this was early, uh, early, early summer, late, late spring. Um, like I said before, though, as long as your host trees and your shrubs are really healthy, they will flush out the leaves. So this is a result from that brown tail moth survey that I was talking about. This is available on our website. 
Um, and so you can see here the aerial survey and the winter web survey. Aerial survey is using the helicopters or the fixed wing airplanes. And the winter web survey is just a whole bunch of folks driving around all over the state, looking at the tops of trees from any road that they can access um, and just documenting how many webs are present. Uh, so you can see we've got a pretty good map here. This has not been updated with 2023 data yet, this specific map that I have on here, but that is um, ongoing. We'll have that posted hopefully soon. Again, working through the data here. Uh, but what is posted and updated is the 2023 data for the winter web survey. Um, so you can actually go to maine.gov slash DACF slash knockout roundtail moth. And this is all um, an interactive map that documents ground tail moth damage. So you can go um, zoom in, zoom out. You can look at your woodlot this way and see if we've documented any um, ground tail moth winter webs in the surrounding area. So it's a, it's a good resource. So natural control for ground tail moth, there's a couple of things that will kill it. Um, birds and other mammals don't tend to eat this critter because of the toxic hairs. Um, so we tend to rely on um, the NPV virus or a fungal virus that, or uh, fungal spores rather, that will kill it. Um, this, I should caution, is really isolated most times. So um, we can't necessarily say that all of the ground tail are going to die from either fungal spores or NPV. Um, so it's, it's usually just uh, pockets of, of this kind of occurrence. But when it does happen, it has the potential to decimate a population for that, for that localized area. So one thing uh, really important because these caterpillars do cause rash is to be able to identify them correctly. Um, so brown tail caterpillars are all over a brown color. They have these white broken stripes that are down the side of their back and they have these two very characteristic red orange spots um, by their rear end. Um, some other things here, not to be confused with Eastern forest tent or spongy moth. These are all present in the state of Maine. Um, Eastern tent and forest tent are both native. So this means that they will have outbreaks, they will eat some leaves as well, but we have a lot of uh, natural and native predators that know how to attack these and keep them in check. Whereas we don't have any native predators currently for brown tail moth that are keeping them in check. So that's why they're, they're kind of running loose right now. Um, and then we have spongy moth, which is another invasive that I'm not gonna touch on today, um, but they don't have the toxic hairs that brown tail moth do, um, but they are also really important defoliators. So um, if you've got a tree stand that has a lot of defoliation, it could be a combination of any of these or one of them. So it's important to be able to recognize what's going on there. The other part of recognizing here is understanding, uh, knowing what to look for for their winter webs. Um, so again, it's just a bundle of leaves usually held together very tightly with some white silk. And they're gonna be at the very tops of your shrubs or your trees that you can see here. So really important that we remove these winter webs if you can. Um, of course, if you've got a really large woodlot, this is not, um, this is not feasible, uh, certainly. But if it's by a shed or some, uh, if your woodlot is on your house, things like that, um, this might be a really uh, important step to be taking to try to mitigate some of the damage that's around your house and also prevent rash, uh, especially if they're overhanging your driveway, your door yard, your porch, things like that. Um, so what you're going to want to do is during the winter time, uh, we actually have Kenny, who's on the call. Thanks, Kenny, for uh, being in this photo. He's got an extendable pruner here, uh, just removing these winter webs. And again, removal is really important, but you want to destroy them. So you can, uh, some folks choose to burn them. Uh, you can obtain a burn permit from the state and burn them in a safely contained fire, throw them right into the fireplace. Um, there's no respiratory con concerns from that, which is fortunate, but um, if, you, if that doesn't seem like something you wanna do, you can also just put them in a bucket of soapy water and let them set for a bit and that will kill them as well. Um, again, more removal here, especially, especially this time of year, if you're in your woodlot a lot, if you're mowing your lawn, if you have a shed somewhere near it, um, or if your house is near it, don't park under high infested areas. Uh, they are really good at hitching a ride. Um, we really don't want to introduce these guys to new areas that they aren't already in. So just make sure that you're checking your vehicles or equipment before you leave is really important. Um, other things, as far as treatments go for brown tail moth, uh, it's not really recommended. Um, if you've got a, a large woodlot to use pesticide treatments on this, 
However, if there's trees that you do want to keep for aesthetic reasons um, or trees that are, again, by your car, in your dooryard, right by your house, things like that, um, those are trees that you probably want to keep an eye on for those winter webs and maybe consider treating in the springtime. So uh, for management, I uh, kind of just a bottom line here, I'm on bigger trees for new winter webs, remove those webs. You want to protect tree roots in the spring and the summer during heavy defoliation, try to give your trees the best opportunity that they can to grow those leaves back. Lights out July is coming up here. Um, they're beginning to pupate into moths, the adult moths. Um, so trying to keep any outside lights off that you can would be really important to not attracting them to your property. Um, there's also research coming out of the University of Maine that's saying that yellow spectrum lights are actually really helpful in um, reducing that attraction. And also, like I said, consider spring treatment for trees that are in high traffic areas. So next thing I'm going to talk about today is hemlock fully indulgent. Uh, again, we, we like our, um, our abbreviations here. So HWA is what you'll see going forward. This is also invasive. It's native to East Asia and it was detected in Maine in the year 2000. And it was likely introduced on untreated plant nursery stock. Um, this one is not as adventurous as brown tail moth though. The host for this is just hemlock trees. And so what these guys do is they actually have uh, piercing sucking mouth parts. So they will insert their, um, their piercing sucking mouth part right into the root of the needle on a hemlock tree. Um, and they will steal all of its nutrients. So you can imagine this is not what the tree wants. Um, unfortunately, this will result in hemlock death in about three to 10 years, depending on the level of infestation. Um, and it also, they've got a couple of different things that they do to protect themselves from predators. Um, they are invasive again. So that means that they don't have any uh, native predators that are gonna know what to do with these guys. Um, but they do have waxy wool coating. This is what they have in the wintertime. Uh, it helps protect them from anything that would eat it. And it also helps them stick to the needle itself. And I should mention they have a winged form, um, which is this image here. But this is not a form that's supported in the state of Maine. We just don't have the trees um, that these, uh, this specific winged form go for. Uh, so you might have heard a couple of years ago, there was a mysterious black substance on Wells Beach that turned out to be a million of dead bugs. That's hemlock woolly adelgia. That's this winged form here. Um, so probably not something you're going to run into, but it's just, I thought it was kind of neat. So um, something to keep an eye on. But again, winged forms are not supported in the state of Maine. So for um, prevention, it's really, really important to know that these adelgid crawlers are very, very small. Um, this, this is all these like little black specks that you're seeing here in reference with this penny is their actual size. So you can imagine uh, this is moved by pretty much anything and everything, uh, including wind and birds and mammals, humans, that kind of a thing. Um, and it only takes one egg or one crawler to start a new infestation. So some signs of uh, HWA damage. Um, again, they are eating on the underside of these needles. So uh, loss of needles or dead needles, um, a lot of loose looking branches, um, yellowing in color, dead trees looking like that. Um, especially if you can look close enough and see the hemocculi adelgid actually eating needles, probably a good sign that they're there. As far as what the main forest service is doing, we do a lot of surveys. Um, so for detections um, through 2022, all of these yellow um, towns are just from 2022 alone. Um, and if we're looking here at the hemlock basal area, this is just the amount of hemlock trees that are in the state. The darker green you go, um, the more hemlock trees are present in that area. So even though hemlock woolly adelgid is pretty much just a coastal pest, it has the potential to move northward. Um, and so it's something to keep an eye on, that's for sure. So uh, on that same kind of note, keeping an eye on, you might see some of your trees have these other pests, um, being elongate hemlock scale, spittle bugs, spider egg sacs, or oak skeletonizer. It's just important to note that um, these are not going to cause the same kind of damage that hemlock woolly adelgid will. Uh, we still care about these, um, but if you're trying to make a report or if you see these and you're not quite sure if it's hemlock woolly adelgid, um, don't hesitate to just send us an email and we can help you figure that out. Some things that you can do to protect your woodlot, uh, monitoring your hemlock trees through December uh, into February is really good because that is when they're most 
clear to see. That's when they have that, that waxy wool coat on them. Um, and so when you're flipping over your hemlock needles, you'll be able to see them on the underside of them. Pruning back high risk hemlocks to prevent movement via cars. Um, this is a photo that was taken. This is a uh, hemlock woolly adelgid um, that actually came in through a car and started attacking this tree. Uh, and also just making sure that you're trimming these high risk hemlocks. So this is a healthy hemlock, but again, if it's, um, if we've learned anything, they travel really easily. So if this car has hemlock woolly adelgid on it, it backs into this tree, a gust of wind comes through, now this tree has hemlock woolly adelgid. So just being mindful. And also removing bird feeders. I know that we have a lot of birders in the state of Maine, uh, but as far as protecting our trees, it's sort of up to you what you wanna prioritize here. Um, again, just birds are a really good way to spread these things around. So preemptive cutting of uninfested forest is not recommended. Uh, this is mostly because it's possible that there could be hemlock really delgid resistant trees um, on your woodlot. And there's a lot of reasons that you would want to cut or not cut um, infested hemlock trees on your woodlot. Again, there's a lot of things to consider here. It just depends on what you are looking to use your woodlot for. Um, so you could do nothing and have the other species take over. You could do light cutting, high intensity cutting. It's sort of just up to what you wanna do with your woodlot. Um, I will say though, if you are going to consider cutting, I would do that when the hemlocks are losing about 50 to 75% of their foliage, uh, only because after that, the tree's really not going to survive at that point and cutting it is hazardous. And then there's biocontrol as well. Uh, so this is a little beetle, we call him Lo, and he is from Japan. And so this is also where HWA is found. So this is a natural predator of HWA. Um, and it's very specific, so it really will only act, it'll only go after HWA, so it won't be attacking any other plants or infesting other um, animals or things like that. And we do do releases, um, they've been successful. It does take a couple of years for this predator to establish, um, but once it, hopefully, if it does become established in more areas, uh, we can see management through beetles. And I'm also 90% sure that you can, this is uh, publicly available for purchase. So if this was an option you wanted to explore, um, that might be something for you. Next thing here is a disease. We have European larch canker or ELC. This is a non-native fungal pathogen. It was detected in the state in 1981, um, but most importantly, it was found outside the quarantine in 2007. And this is also very specific. So it only attacks larch or tamarack trees. So this fungus causes a bunch of cankers um, on trees. And you can think of a canker like an open wound. So this is just dead infected portion of a tree. It can cause girdling to happen where the bark actually separates from the cambium um, and interrupts some nutrient flow. So as you can imagine, not good for the tree. And uh, because it's basically an open wound right into the inner side of the tree, it can allow for other pathogens to enter as well. So not something you wanna have on your robot. Signs and symptoms, we're looking for both. So when you're looking at your woodlot for potential ELC, you wanna look for cankers that look something like this, but you also want to look for the actual fungus itself. So very, very, very small uh, pinpricks of, of white um, deformed branches like this. Um, and it's easiest to see on younger saplings only because if your tree is really, really tall and you're not also 18 feet tall, it's gonna be hard to see the spores on them. Some of the quarantines that are going on for ELC right now are mostly in the down east region um, and coastal regions here. This is where ELC is confirmed. So if you have woodlots in these areas, I would just uh, certainly monitor your trees for this kind of thing, uh, prevent future damage. And as far as large distribution in the state goes, um, unsurprisingly, there's a large amount uh, in the down east and, and regions where it's already been found. Uh, but there's also potential uh, for high population up in the Northern Aristic County. So um, again, just something that you wanna keep track of. So like I've been saying here, we're keeping track of it. We're monitoring our alerts trees for cankers and fungal spores. You really wanna have both for correct diagnosis. Um, disinfecting equipment in quarantine areas or areas where infections are present, really, really important to not spread it to other things. Um, and pruning infected branches, if there's only one branch that's infected. If there's more than one branch that's infected, the whole tree or main stem, 
it's probably just best to remove the tree, but again, it's, it's up to you and how you wanna manage your woodlot. All right, the last thing that I'm gonna talk about here is ticks. I'm trying to be mindful of time here. Um, we only have a couple of minutes left and I wanna make sure that there's time for questions. Um, so just very briefly here, there are two sets of ticks that are really, really commonly encountered in the state of Maine, and that would be black-legged ticks and American dog ticks. Um, they have a bunch of different hosts, uh, humans normally, the ones that I get talked to about the most. Uh, but this data or data that I'm going to show in the rest of this presentation is from the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. Um, they come out with an annual report every year and they are a great resource for anything tick related. So as far as identification goes, there's two different kinds, uh, black-legged tick here and the American dog tick that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, the, do the dog tick's typically a lot bigger than the black-legged tick, um, but I should mention that um, these don't often bite humans, but they can. Uh, black-legged ticks will bite humans and they often do. If you're ever confused about what, um, what tick you might have on yourself or your pet um, going through your woodlot, you just see a bunch, TickEncounter.org is a really good resource. This is based out of the University of Rhode Island. I actually worked with Tom Mather um, and he's phenomenal and a great resource. So uh, certainly something to check out if you have questions. Pathogens in Maine for black-legged ticks, there's quite a number of them. Um, there's also quite a number for the American dog tick, but I should say that the primary vector of uh, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever or uh, Rickettsia is American dog tick, but there has not been any confirmed main acquired cases that we uh, that we know of so far. So um, it is it, it has the potential to carry things that can make humans really sick, but right now uh, there's no pathogens present in the state that we know of. Uh, more on pathogen testing here. Main takeaway is really just that um, there's an increasing infection prevalence in the state of Maine. So. I want you to be aware, not afraid. So you, of course, have a lot of woodlot. You probably have trails in them. You enjoy being outdoors. Um, there's things that you can do to reduce tick populations and reduce the chance of you getting a tick bite. Uh, just, I would try to just caution here. Don't let the possibility of a tick bite stop you from using your woodlot the way that you want to. Um, and so just tick distribution in Maine. This is again, based out of the University of Maine. Um, most of the ticks that were submitted for tick ID were consistent in the southern and the central Maine regions, uh, but trends are expanding northward, so this could become more of a problem as the years go on. Two-year life cycle for black-legged ticks. Um, greatest risk of human exposure is in late spring and summer, which is also the best time for management. Uh, so some of the management that you can do to protect yourself, of course, is personal protection. So this is just avoiding tick-infested areas in general. Um, these typically look like wooded or brushy areas with tall grass and leaf litter and doing things like tucking pants into socks, tucking your shirt into your pants, light colored clothing so that you can see ticks that are crawling on you, uh, wearing tick repellent, all that kind of things are things that you can do to really protect yourself. Um, and again, tick checking is so, so important that you do this for not only yourself, but for younger children, older adults, um, and pets as well that are going to be uh, running around in your woodlot. And just as an interesting note, legs and torso were the most common attachment sites uh, based on the ticks that were submitted to the university. Some landscape-based management that you can do um, is create a three foot wide wood chip barrier, um, something that looks like this. Ticks, especially black leg ticks are really prone to desiccation or drying out. So if they do happen to come into your yard and they drop off a deer or a rodent or things like that, um, it's very unlikely that they'll actually get back into the woods and survive. Um, so wood chip berry is really good. Keeping your lawns mowed really short, keeping the trails if they're also grassy mowed really short is helpful. Um, and also just keeping a really clean area. So clearing leaf litter, tall grasses and brush from around homes or walls um, is helpful. Also just to trying to dissuade deer and rodents from your yard. This is probably not possible in a woodlot, so I wouldn't worry about that too much. But if your woodlot is also uh, where your house is, something like a deer fence um, could considerably reduce the amount of ticks on your yard. Other things you can do, trim overgrown shrubs or grasses that are in trail pathways uh, in your woodlot, and also removing invasive plants. These three are really, really good at creating the perfect microclimate for ticks. So. Um, Japanese barberry, glossy buckthorn, and honeysuckle. 
not only are they invasive, they're out competing our, our native plants, but they're also really great for ticks. So get rid of them. And so that being said, if uh, there's things that you still had questions about, we have this tree, tree ailment form on our website. Uh, if you just type in Maine Forest Service, what's going wrong with my tree, this form will pop up. Um, and you can put in your information and submit a bunch of photos and we'll get back to you and try to ID that test. Um, I wanna take this time to, again, just reiterate that we will be doing the second part of this tour on Saturday, uh, where we'll be able to show you in person a whole bunch of cool things. Uh, we'll actually have tons of brochures, handouts, um, and actual um, things that you can see that we won't see in the field, just so you have a, an idea of what they look like. Um, and again, this is Saturday from 9 to 11.30 a.m. And this is uh, right in Old Town, Maine on Old Stagecoach Road, uh, where Larry's Woodlot is. And that being said, I'm right at the time here. So <laughs> um, I wanna thank you for joining us tonight. Um, and uh, we are both happy to take as many questions as time will allow. It looks like we have a question right in the chat. Okay. So how could I support a defoliated tree? Um, this uh, would require more information. We would need to know like what type of tree you're talking about. There are a couple of pests that are very host specific. Um, for instance, you know, if it's a spruce, it could be anything from, you know, an adelgid to, you know, spruce budworm, um, depending, oh, pears and apple trees. Okay, so this would be probably be something uh, like a defoliating caterpillar, I would assume. But Brittany, if you want to talk maybe about like brown tail management, that might help. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me stop sharing there so we can have a conversation. <laughs> there we go. Um, okay, so yeah, supporting a defoliated tree, especially if it's a fruit tree, um, which is probably likely going to be brown tail, um, depending where you are, um, could be a couple of other things, but it's probably caterpillar based. And if that's the case, um, Depending on where the tree is, not parking cars on it would be a really great way to start. Um, you, what, if there's roots that are visible, um, getting mulch or something to keep them really hydrated is also helpful. Um, being careful to mow around it. I, I know that you want to keep the grass shorter if it's on a yard, but I would just avoid that altogether, especially if those roots are showing. Um, but if your tree is otherwise really healthy, um, we're having a bunch of rain too, which has been really great to help with some of the drought. Um, your tree is probably going to be okay, but it's really just that that red flag, that warning flag is really going to come up when there's repeated years of defoliation. Because um, typically deciduous trees are, are good at storing nutrients. It's, it takes a lot for them to flush out those, those leaves um, and for them to have to do it again during you know, a season when they should only have to do it once is stressful, but it's normally not going to kill them. So really just root management is, um, is what I would say I would focus on the most. Any other questions? All right, well, if there are no more questions, I suppose we can wrap. But uh, again, we encourage everybody to come by Larry's on Saturday. We'll be starting fairly early for Saturday, I suppose, but 9 a.m. Um, We'll be there and we'll have lots of goodies, as Brittany said. And so we hope that all of you can make it. Thank you very much. Cool, good job team. <laughs> All right. Oh, Larry, I think you're muted. No, I think it was a very informative presentation and uh, my sense is folks got a lot of information out of it and uh, hopefully they'll uh, feel motivated to come and uh, join us on Saturday. Yeah, I hope so. I hope it wasn't too much information. <laughs> really tried to... <laughs> try I, <know>. to... <laughs> I was afraid we rushed, but... Yeah. A lot of content. Yeah. yeah. No, I think it went well.
Excellent. Thank you. I did, I did a lot of screenshots because I wanted to follow up on some of those things. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful. That's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. All okay. right. I guess. Have a good evening, everybody. We will. Yeah. Is there anything uh, you need uh, on the Saturday? I'm planning on being there oh, probably around eight o'clock or so. We'll get the signs out. Uh, we'll get the coffee ready. We'll get the tables out and all of that sort of stuff. So, All right. It'd be good. Yeah, Gabe, I don't know what time you wanted to try to get over there, but I mean, we'll, we'll certainly be there earlier than, than nine. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe aim for like 8.30, 8.15. Yeah, that works for me. Like that. Sounds good. Yeah. That would be perfect. Yep. yep. Then okay, I'll have great. Ready for you. Yeah. Okay. All, all right. right. Sounds good, Larry. Uh, right. We'll see you Saturday. You bet. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. See you later, Larry. Well, see bye. You. <laughs>